oh, it hurts. Help. Struggling with the pain in my back and legs, all I could do was whimper softly. Just as I returned to my apartment and entered the parking lot, a car that had been stopped in front of me suddenly charged at me at full speed. Hit by the car without a chance to avoid it, a dull thud echoed in the parking area. I hit the asphalt hard with my back and bottom, enduring the pain. As I did, my thigh hurt so much I couldn't help but wince. I must have cut it on the asphalt when I fell. Blood started seeping out of my thigh. As I was lost in the horrific sight, I heard the sound of a car door opening. Out from the passenger side came my husband, Martin. Martin! Martin! Even as I called out his name with a trembling voice, he wouldn't meet my eyes. Walking to the front of the car, Martin's gaze was fixed only on the bumper that had hit me. He examined every inch of the car, not responding to any of my calls. When he finally stood up, he turned to the driver's seat with a gentle smile and said, The car's not damaged. Are you okay, Mom? Must have been a shock. It seemed that to Martin, the sight of me bleeding was less important than Jasmine, his mother, who was pale in the driver's seat. A deep anger welled up inside me. And then my name is Charlotte. I'm a 25-year-old office worker. I moved from the countryside to attend a city university and ended up working at a company near the university. I started dating Martin, a salesman visiting our company, and we had just gotten married a month ago. Charlotte, even if you continue working, what should we do about where to live? Maybe it's time to start thinking about building a house, Martin would say. We don't have to decide right now. Let's rent an apartment and then look for a plot of land or discuss what kind of house we want. But I do want to live in a detached house someday, so let's start saving for it, I replied. We were happy just talking about the future. Martin was an only child. His family was just his mother, as his father had passed away a few years ago, and he had been living at home. We were about to get married, looking at various apartments, but then Jasmine, his mother, suggested we move in with her. I was hesitant about moving in right after getting married, but Martin quickly communicated our decision not to live with Jasmine. He expressed his concern about leaving Jasmine alone and suggested renting a house near his parents' home instead. Thinking this was better than living together, I agreed. So, we decided to rent an apartment within walking distance of his mother's home. Charlotte, thank you so much. I'm so happy to have you both nearby. After my husband passed away, living with just Martin was reassuring. But if I lost him too, I'd feel so anxious. So I'm truly grateful. Thank you, Jasmine. I'm glad you're nearby, too, and this meal is really delicious. I appreciate it. It's nothing, dear. Food tastes better when there's more of it, so don't worry about it. Because we lived within walking distance, Jasmine frequently checked in on us. Both of us were busy working, and during peak season, we'd come home late. Knowing this, Jasmine would bring over home-cooked meals once a week. Honestly, our late-night returns being a norm during busy periods— Having dinner prepared by Jasmine was a relief. Jasmine was kind and a good person, and I felt happy to have married into such a family. Even my mother had been pleased with Martin and Jasmine from the time of the family meeting. What wonderful good people they are, she said. Martin and I were enjoying our newlywed life, getting along well. Even after marriage, we often went for drives on weekends. Martin was someone who loved cars, owning a vehicle he was particularly fond of. Martin really loves cars, doesn't he? You're the first person I've met who's this passionate about them. Really? Isn't my car always clean? I think it's important to keep it nice, especially when I'm driving Charlotte around. As Martin said, riding in a clean car indeed feels good. I loved these moments with Martin. I believed they would continue forever, without a doubt. But about a month after we got married, I started feeling like these happy days might be at risk. Mom, stop it. I'm not a child. I can eat by myself. I'm fine. But look, if Martin hurts his hand, it won't be good. He needs his hand for his computer work. I know, but Charlotte is here too. It's okay. Hey, we always eat like this. Let me do it for you. On this day, Jasmine had brought crab to our house. She meticulously peeled the crab meat and handed it to Martin. I watched the scene from the kitchen, feeling a bit perplexed. Martin is the same age as me. He can certainly eat crab by himself. 
And even though he uses his computer for work as a salesperson who actively goes out to earn, it's not a critical issue. In fact, when he ate crab with me, he peeled and ate it himself without any problem. Martin, this one has a lot of meat. Open up. I can eat by myself. It's okay. It's okay. Jasmine snugly sat next to Martin, feeding him the crab. Honestly, I thought he could eat it himself without needing to be that close. I began to notice how unusually close Martin and Jasmine were from that day. Once I started feeling that way, every little thing began to bother me. I'm going to take Mom to her lesson today. What? But we had plans to go to the movies this evening. Remember? I even bought the tickets. Sorry, sorry. The movie will come out on DVD or something later. So let's just watch it then, since you bought tickets. Why don't you go watch it by yourself for now? He may not be a total mama's boy, but for some reason, Martin always seemed to do whatever Jasmine asked. Not long ago, Jasmine suddenly called, wanting pizza in the evening. We had plans to go out for steak that day. We were ready to leave, standing at the front door when the call came. I thought we'd all go for pizza together, but Martin left me with, sorry, go have steak by yourself, and went to pick up Jasmine. When I complained to Martin upon his return, he said he'd be more careful next time, but nothing really changed. Martin continued to prioritize Jasmine whenever our plans clashed for whatever reason, and Jasmine accepted it as if it were her due. In fact, she seemed to try and stay close to Martin as much as possible. Apparently, at Martin's request, Jasmine started delivering dinner to our house and often stayed to eat with us. It became a routine occurrence once or twice a week. No matter how much I protested that it must be a burden for Jasmine. It's okay. I live nearby, she'd say, with no sign of stopping. Moreover, we were often invited to tea parties or meals at the in-law's house on weekends. Naturally, our time as a couple dwindled and I couldn't find time for household chores I'd planned to do over the weekend. If I suggested Martin go alone, Jasmine would insist on inviting me as well. Whether she came to our house or we called on the in-laws, the implications were the same. Jasmine began to criticize my housekeeping. Charlotte, I know you both work, but you should at least prepare a proper dinner. Relying on ready-made meals is just not acceptable for a housewife. I'm sorry. When I get home late, Martin prefers to pick up his favorite ready-made meals. Hearing my words, Jasmine's eyes widened in shock. What's this? Not only do you barely cook, but you have Martin picking up dinner? Can't believe it. Do you even realize how busy he is? As a wife, you should properly consider your family's nutrition and at least make meals. Crossing her arms, she looked at me and started speaking sternly. Mostly, I'm the one who makes your dinners. I started doing it once a week because I knew you were busy, but it turned into two or even three times. And on weekends? You eat at our place, so you hardly have any opportunity to cook dinner. Being busy is no excuse. Everyone is busy. I couldn't hide my sigh at Jasmine's words. Whose fault does she think it is that I don't even have time to cook dinner anymore? She was the one who imposed meals on us, repeatedly bringing them despite our refusals. As I was about to retort, Martin stepped in front of me and glared. That's right, Charlotte. Mom's cooking is great, but you can't rely on it all the time. It's too much of a burden for her to bring food over, and it's not healthy to keep eating ready-made meals. Try making something yourself from time to time. Exactly, Martin. A husband needs to properly discipline his wife, Jasmine added. But you know, Martin, it's not like I dislike cooking. I know I love your home cooking the best, Mom, I interjected. Then Jasmine and Martin were in their own world again. Unnoticed were my silence and chill in my gaze. Charlotte is so young, so I understand some of it is inevitable. Even if she had time, I don't expect her to make delicious food. Probably just makes heavy, unhealthy meals. That's right. Charlotte likes steak, so she prefers meaty dishes, and she's a bit naive about the world. Meat isn't everything. You need to think about vegetables and have a balanced intake. Charlotte just isn't capable of thinking about nutrition yet. She doesn't have the experience as a housewife like you do, Mom, Martin chimed in. Both Martin and Jasmine belittled me. At some point, arguing back seemed pointless. I just wished they would leave quickly, but staying silent meant being labeled as rude by the two of them. Ignoring it all, eventually a content Jasmine would leave for her home. The moment Jasmine was gone, 
Martin started playing games on his mobile phone. Finally, I confronted him. Hey, what are you trying to do? You get Jasmine to bring over unsolicited meals and then criticize me for not cooking. I can't cook because Jasmine always brings over so much food, and both of you criticize me about cooking and cleaning, but you don't realize that I don't have time for that because Jasmine keeps coming over. If you want me to do it, then stop calling your mom over. Or if you prefer her so much, why don't you just go back and live with her? I exclaimed. Martin glanced at me briefly and then laughed mockingly. What's the matter? Are you jealous? We've been close as a family for years. It's known around the neighborhood. Plus, if you learned from my mom, you could improve your skills too. Don't be cold and say things like, don't call her, just learn from her. His response was so off the mark that I was left speechless. Without waiting for my reply, Martin's attention went right back to his mobile phone game. I felt a heavy sense of futility. Martin wasn't the person I once loved anymore. Eventually, I started to stand up to Jasmine, ready to be disliked by her. Yet Jasmine kept imposing herself, saying she would teach me. When I couldn't stand it anymore, I refused to let Jasmine in the house when she came over and told her directly that it was bothersome. Jasmine looked dumbfounded at first, then became red-faced and shouted back. When I shut the door on her, Martin joined in with her in yelling and charged into the living room. That seemed to be the last straw. Jasmine started interfering even in my work. Charlotte, can't you reduce your work hours? You're not getting the cleaning done during the week. You need to keep things tidier. Today is Martin's turn to tidy up. Please tell him that, she ordered. What are you thinking? Making your husband who works outside do the house cleaning. I work outside too. We both work outside the home, so we both do the housework, I argued. Even if Jasmine understood the concept of both partners working, she strongly believed housework was the wife's responsibility. She seemed to think I was shirking my duties onto Martin. Jasmine sighed heavily, as if frustrated. Charlotte, there's a difference in income between you and Martin. It's normal for the one earning less to take on more household chores. If you should become a housewife, you can't manage that. Maybe you should consider becoming a housewife. Unfortunately, our incomes are nearly the same, and with Martin's income alone, becoming a housewife isn't feasible. I have to work too. We both work full-time and come home around the same time, yet you are saying I alone should do the housework. It's not about the time you get home. You have no respect or gratitude for Martin who works hard every day. I countered. Before I could even reply, Jasmine dramatically threw up her hands and sighed in exasperation. I wanted to retort that Martin showed me neither gratitude nor respect, but Jasmine wasn't listening anymore. Even as Jasmine and I became increasingly antagonistic, Martin never once listened to my side. He'd side with Jasmine and blame me along with her. He stopped doing anything around the house and began spending more time at his mom's than at home. If I ever brought it up, he would start berating me furiously, so I ended up just watching Martin leave. It was easier to have him spend time at his parents' house than force our coexistence. One day, as I was walking home early from work, I entered the apartment complex. Just then, in the parking lot, I saw Martin and Jasmine, apparently about to leave in our car. I didn't even want to greet them and tried to hurry past when suddenly, the car in front of me sped up directly towards me. I tried to dodge, but the speed was too much, and I was knocked down. Luckily, I didn't hit my head, but I noticed blood coming from a severely painful leg. Apparently, I had cut it on an asphalt protrusion as I fell, causing blood to gush from my thigh. As I panicked about the blood loss, the car door opened, but only Martin got out, leaving the passenger door open. He started carefully checking the area of the car I had presumably hit. He didn't even look at me once. Jasmine, looking pale, remained in the driver's seat and didn't even try to get out. Hey! I finally got Martin's attention. As the bleeding continued and I thought of going to the hospital, Martin turned away from me towards the driver's seat. It's fine. The car is not damaged. Are you hurt, Mom? That was scary, wasn't it? Are you okay? Martin said, smiling gently at Jasmine. I was dumbfounded by his words. Here I was bleeding in front of him, and all he cared about was the car and Jasmine. At Jasmine's reassurance, Martin smiled gently and was about to get back into the passenger seat. Hey, don't just sit in the middle of the road. You're blocking the cars, you know, Martin said casually. 
His lack of concern and that remark made my anger explode. Don't joke with me. You hit me with your car, and now you're blaming me? It's your fault. You suddenly accelerated in a parking lot. What if I had been someone else? Would you say the same thing to them? I yelled in frustration. You're not someone else, you're family. Even if I hit you, I'd be the one paying for the repairs. You get that? There's no benefit for me hitting you. Understand? No, no benefit. You're the one who hit me. Why should I be the one getting blamed? Martin argued back. As Martin and I were arguing, Jasmine finally got out of the driver's seat and approached me with a domineering stance. Charlotte, do you have any idea how much Martin's car costs? You were the one who ran into it, and yet you speak like that. The first thing you should do is apologize. I was so astounded by the situation that I was at a loss for words. Despite the car accelerating because of Jasmine's foot on the pedal, somehow she believed I had run into them. Why are you still sitting there with a victim's face? It's all your fault for not walking on the sidewalk, as Martin said. You're the one at fault. That's right. It's Charlotte's fault. Now go back home and take care of things. That's all you can do right now. I was speechless at their words. Jasmine and Martin insisted I had run into the car at high speed. Their absurd claim made my head spin. Impatient with my immobility, Martin dragged me to the side of the road, ignoring my cries of pain. They drove off immediately after. Someone rushed to my side. Are you okay? I've called the police. Please get into my car. Let's go to the hospital. The person offering help was a colleague who lived in the same apartment complex. Thinking about asking her for a towel to avoid soiling her car due to all the blood, dizziness overcame me again, likely from too much blood loss. I realized the severity of my condition only after receiving treatment at the hospital and explaining everything to the doctors. I was told I needed to stay for a few days, but I hadn't prepared for such an event. Even if I wanted someone from home to bring my things, I wasn't sure if Martin would be there, and even if he was, I didn't want to rely on him. Fortunately, there was a shop in the hospital, so I asked the nurse to make some preparations. Instead of notifying my company and thanking the colleague who brought me in, I barely finished when my mobile phone began to vibrate. It was a call from Martin. I had no intention of answering, but accidentally pressed the answer button while talking to my colleague, and Martin's voice came through. I finally picked up. Mom's in a lot of trouble because of you, and you have the nerve to ignore calls from your family. What? Who are you? I don't have a hit-and-run offender in my family. I firmly retorted to Martin's words. What? Now you're calling my mom a hit-and-run driver, too? The whole neighborhood is buzzing with rumors that she did a hit-and-run? The police might come. They say you reported it, didn't you? It's a misunderstanding, and apologize to the police and mom. It's a hit-and-run if you hit someone and flee, and I didn't report it, as Martin spoke. I didn't report it. Excitedly, I told him it was my colleague who had taken me to the hospital and reported it. He seemed taken aback, a faint click of his tongue audible. Well, you pretending to be the victim and telling the police should clear it all up. Come quickly. I have to be hospitalized. I can't. Besides, you were sitting in the passenger seat, right? Do you really believe I ran into the car and fell? When Martin heard my retort about playing the victim, he was silent for a moment. Then he spoke to me in a scolding tone, as if I were a child. Look, Charlotte, if Mom really made a mistake driving and hit you, what do you think would happen? She might become too scared to ever drive again. Don't you think that's pitiful? That doesn't make sense. Someone who drives that dangerously shouldn't be driving at all. Why do you have to say it like that? Just tell the police you weren't looking either, and it's all settled. Don't you get it? Families help each other when they're in trouble. I sighed deeply at what felt like a hopeless conversation. Your idea of family and mine are very different. I'll be sending divorce papers once I'm discharged, so be prepared. I need to end this call now. The police will be interviewing me. Hey, hey, why does a problem between you and mom lead to us getting divorced? I cut off the call, unable to contain my anger any longer. To calm down, I took several deep breaths and began planning my return to my parental home. I would need to take a plane and a ferry to get there, a long journey, but I no longer had a choice. I had been preparing for the possibility of divorce, so packing my things wouldn't be a problem. 
I gave my mom keys to my house so she could collect my belongings during the weekdays, when Martin was likely absent during my hospital stay. The police came for an interview. It turns out the apartment security cameras caught me being hit, providing evidence that could lead to Jasmine's arrest. By the time I was discharged from the hospital, Jasmine had been arrested. Apparently, when the police went to the family home to inquire, Jasmine tried to flee and was quickly apprehended. As for me, I returned to my parental home with my belongings my mother collected, not intending to go back to my house. I resigned from my job, looking to start anew in the countryside. The warm send-off I received when I visited my company to say goodbye contributed to my positive outlook. A few days later, when I initiated divorce proceedings through a lawyer, Martin vehemently refused. He even showed up at my parents' doorstep, but my dad firmly sent him away. Despite Martin's repeated claims of misunderstanding, the evidence was already against them, making any chance of absolving Jasmine's crime impossible. Dad, incensed by Martin's incessant cries of family, furiously slammed the door shut. Never call my daughter family again. Get out of here. Martin still tried to pry open the door, but then suddenly turned around. A group of imposing, well-built neighbors stared him down. With stern looks, startled, Martin dashed off towards the harbor, likely seeking the ferry terminal. Eventually, my divorce from Martin was finalized. It turned out that not only Jasmine, who was driving, but also Martin, who was the passenger, were under investigation for hit and run. Unlike Jasmine, who fled and was apprehended, Martin cooperated with the police and was under house arrest, a more lenient form of investigation without physical detention. However, due to my moving away by plane and ferry to my parental home, they considered there was a risk of fleeing, leading to a similar treatment as Jasmine. Perhaps by showing willingness to comply with the divorce, Martin was trying to indicate his remorse, but as long as the divorce was finalized, I was content. The colleague who informed me about the proceedings said that Martin and Jasmine's case had become the talk of the neighborhood. A husband who worries about the mother who hit his wife more than the wife herself. The worst parent and child duo for hit and run. It seems to be the talk of the town every day. With Martin and Jasmine now unreachable, my only recourse was to proceed through my lawyer. Not that I minded, as I preferred not to see their faces again. Future dealings with their insurance company, police investigations, and whether the prosecution would proceed were expected to be time-consuming. My only wish was for a swift resolution so that I would never have to contact them again. Have to con